I want you to go to the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to read you one, one verse of Proverbs. We're going to hit more, but I'm going to start in Proverbs 18, 24. Proverbs 18, 24. The Bible says, Hay amigos que llevan a la ruina, y hay amigos más fieles que un hermano. There's one who has unreliable friends, and those soon come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. One version says, a man of many companions will come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We've talked about marriage, we've talked about parenting, we've talked about love. Today I want to talk about friendship. Specifically, I want to address how to make friends. Let's pray. Jesus, help. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. And let me draw your attention to the North American porcupine. That's what he looks like. You're going to see him up here on the screen. The North American porcupine. It's actually a member of the rodent family. If anybody likes rodents, North American porcupine has... 3,000 quills attached to their body. Each quill can be driven into their enemy. Kind of the barbs go into the enemy. These little microscopic barbs expand in their body, causing damage to the body. Sometimes vital organs shut down. Sometimes it's even fatal to its victim. Not usually considered one of the more lovable animals, the porcupine. There's movies that stir up our imagination. We see movies about dogs and movies about cats and movies about even pigs, movies about killer whales, of all things. You don't really see like a movie about a cute little porcupine. Because porcupines, especially when conflict hits, they they tend to have one of a couple of reactions. One is they, they flee, run to the bushes or the trees. The other is they attack. It's really flee or attack. That's kind of what porcupines do. And It really arouses a dilemma for the porcupine because how do you get close to other people when that's how you do things? How could you ever get close? And in the series on relationships that we call Breaking Bread, it really is the same same dilemma that we have. Porcupines tend to be very solitary animals because you can imagine with quills going everywhere, it makes it quite difficult to draw near, and this is really our thing too. We might not have physical quills, but we have quills of envy and quills of rejection and quills of anger and quills of suspicion and quills of paranoia and and quills of all sorts of hate. There's all sorts of quills that we have, which really leaves us with the same problem or question. How do you get close when you've got all these defense mechanisms up? And the answer is we don't. The statistics are bearing out basically year after year with increasing measure that we are becoming lonelier than we've ever been, that culture is actually becoming more lonely than ever. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is we travel way more. Like Americans are traveling a lot. Like we, we, we go to on vacation. We take trips out of town for the weekend. We do travel basketball, travel volleyball, travel baseball, travel stamp collecting. We travel. And so it's, it's hard to connect with people when you're always gone. A lot of our jobs even, that's like, this is not like a moral statement, just a statement of fact that we tra- we're traveling more than ever. It's, it's also true that these, these phones of ours, we we, down, we go in the app stores and we download apps that are called social media apps, which is really quite ironic because the evidence is the more time you spend on social media, the more anti-social you become. It's very odd that a medium that was created for the purpose of connecting has actually caused us We will be sitting right next to someone at lunch today and we're scrolling through our phones disconnected while we're connecting. And so it's it's really interesting what's what's sort of happened to us. And so when we come to something like friendship, the problem with friendship is it feels so unnecessary. Like there's parts, there's relationships we have that are obviously necessary. All of you are children of somebody. Someone 
pushed you into this world, right? Or that's not the right way. If you know what I'm saying, like someone helped create you. Someone joined in the creative process of God to allow, to allow you to breathe air in this, in this world, right? You, you need to have parents. You can't get around it. You have to have parents. You, you have to have moms and dads, and, and there's brothers. And, you didn't choose your brothers and sisters. Some of you are like, yeah, tell me about it. You didn't choose your brother and sister. You have to choose your friends, though. And because of that, because of the fact that we're super busy and because of the fact that we're more disconnected than ever and because of the fact that many of us, let's just be honest, have been hurt, our porcupine quills go up, keeping us safe and at distance. And we've got a real dilemma that has taken place where, where marriage, people get, end up getting married. You can't help it. Like C.S. Lewis writes in his book, The Four Loves, about erotic love. Like, you kind of can't help it. I mean, one of the theme verses for a lot of Christian young people is it's better to marry than to burn. There's a lot of people that got married because they said, I don't want to burn with lust, so I'm going to go get married. I'm not downing erotic love. God invented erotic love. God invented all of that. What I'm saying is, there's, you, you, physiologically, you feel that one. Physiologically, there's an instinctual nature. Uh, like moms have an instinct in them to take care of their children. Fathers have an instinct about their families. There's not an instinct that makes you get a friend, which is why it's easy to peace out on friends, which is why it's really easy to have social media friends that are as easy as unfriending them as a click of your index finger. That friendship's done. He gone. She gone. And we click people out of our lives, and we block people from following us, and we, and we get to mute people's voices. Back in the day, people would say, talk to the hand. Now we just say, talk to the hand with a click of the thumb. The, the, the problem is, I'm not sure if you understand how necessary friendship is. I'm looking at the book of Proverbs, and usually I wait sort of toward the end of the sermon to give you an application for a sermon. Uh, I will tell you today, my application in this sermon is I would encourage you to begin reading the book of Proverbs and finding everything you can find about relationships and friendships. Because what I have discovered when I was getting ready for this message was there is more about friendship in the book of Proverbs than not just any other book of the Bible, but almost any other work of antiquity, any other sacred text. The book of Proverbs has more concentrated revelation and illumination and information about friendships and relationships and almost anything else. A lot of us are really good at loving God and we're not really good at loving people. It's kind of like people that only read Psalms and they never get to Proverbs. Go read the book of Proverbs. See, erotic love will get you married. Friendship love will keep you married. I'm telling you, I've, I've, I've met people that have been married for 60, even 70 years. I've never heard someone say, ooh, we've been married for 60 years, and I'm telling you, the romance is as hot today as it was on the first day. <laughs> no one ever says that. What I have heard is, when we got married, I was hot for her. Hopefully, she was hot for me. But as we stayed married, I discovered that she, who was my lover, has become my best. I, even when I'm talking to young people that are wanting to get married, like, hey, Mike, I'm, I'm looking for my soulmate. I'm looking for, I'm looking for, I'm like, stop looking for your soulmate. Like, well, no, but I want to marry my soulmate. You don't marry your soulmate. You become someone's soulmate after a lifetime of walking through ups and downs and valleys and ditches and all kinds. Get to the other side. Get to the end of a bunch of that kind of stuff. You go through some miscarriages and some recessions and some difficult times and you lost everything and you got it back and had success and you lost and go, go through that. I'll you, you, don't, you don't start off as someone's soulmate. You become someone's soulmate. That's how that works. And what they usually mean, what that really means is, I stopped just being infatuated with you. I actually came to love you. Like, I just loved you. Even if all the parts weren't working, even if all the sides of marriage weren't still functioning, I just loved you for you. See, this is why the Bible, this is why Proverbs says, a person of many companions 
comes to ruin. Meaning you can have so, and we are right now, we have so many companions. We've got a thousand people that are with us on Facebook and we've got a thousand people that are with us on Instagram and we've got coworkers and we've got family reunions and we've got so many companions. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs says, better is a neighbor nearby. Better is a friend nearby than a brother far away. Families are great, but you know what? The reality is a friend that sticks closer than a brother will change your life. When, when you're growing up, it's, it's really your, really a, a child is defined by their parents. Show me your parents, I'll show you who you are. Show me your family, I'm gonna show you who you are. But the reality is after you leave the house, the most important decision you'll make other than marriage is tell me who your friends are. Of course, every youth pastor in the world has preached the message, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. But today I really want to say this, because when I've read through the book of Proverbs, and honestly, your homework is Proverbs, I'm calling you to go to the book of Proverbs, because finding and forming true friendships is one of the wisest decisions that you'll ever make. Finding, and fo- finding it's hard. And forming, it takes time. True, that's rare. Friendships, way more rare than you realize it is, is one of, and I'm going to say it, it's one of the wisest decisions. The average man in America has zero. The average person in America has lost multiple friends during the pandemic. Politics, all the stuff, vaccinations, all the stuff. Finding and forming true friendships is one of the wisest decisions you'll ever make. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with the wise, that, who, that, that there's, there's just something about whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools comes to harm. Finding and forming true friendships is one of the wisest decisions that you'll ever make. So how do we do it? How do we make friends? Three thoughts. Number one, check your motives. Number one, check your motives. Proverbs 14, 20 says, the poor are shunned even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. Proverbs 19, 4, wealth attracts many friends, but even those closest to the friend of a poor man deserts him. Proverbs 19, 6, many curry favor with the ruler and everyone is the friend of one who gives gifts. Now I have heard people use these as a evidence of why they want to get rich because they said, if you get rich, you'll have many friends. That's not what Proverbs is saying. What Proverbs is making you know is this, everybody kisses up to people that give gifts, which is why when you've got power or you've got money or you've got leverage or you've got privilege, it's hard to know if someone loves you or if they love what they're getting out of you. Very, very dangerous. Number one, if you want to make friends, check your motives. Why? And, and I totally get it. Like we're in a world now, people pick, they, they pick their, their spots to network. And, they, and they're trying to network over here and they're trying to network over there and they're making moves over here and they're making moves over there and you want to get in the right side of the room and you want to get in the right place to have conversations with the right person. You want to get in a picture to get in a magazine down the back of a ma- you know, Gainesville magazine where you're in the place where all the it people are. I get all of what I'm trying to tell you is The man that's got a bunch of companions is going to come to ruin. Do you have friends? I mean, if you go broke, they're still with you. I mean, if you get canceled by everyone else, they're still with you. I mean, do you have friends? Because the evidence is, if you do, you're going to thrive in ways that no one else does. Money, wealth, power, they sound good. The problem is they complicate things. What's the real reason those people want to be friends with you? Let's flip it. What's the real reason you want to be friends with them? I was pretty humbled recently. I was in a gathering of pastors, and like the cool pastor in the room was, was over there, and I was like, oh my gosh, like he's here. Like I want to go kind of make my way to that side of the room to get near this guy, and like, you know, because, oh, I just, who knows, maybe he just needs a, in my mind, I'm, I don't even know what I'm thinking in my mind, he might just need a friend, someone that just could care about him just for him. Must be lonely being up there at that cool top spot like him, you know? And so I'm trying to make my way to him, and in the way of trying to get to him, I get interrupted by some, uh, some person, some other pastor. It wasn't him. And I wanted to be with him for the Lord. Lord. 
what is it about us when we meet like famous people? We're like, like, this happened to me. I was at the airport in Brazil. I saw Ronaldo. I didn't know who he was. So I was like, oh my gosh, you're standing right. And I, I was right next to Ronaldo. I'm like, what? I'm, like, I said, I didn't know who it was. I, like, this, is, this was years ago. It's like, wait, I don't even know who this guy is. And, and they're like, dude, that's Ronaldo. I'm like, who? They're like, like one of the most famous soccer players. They're like, oh, I'm like, well, I need to go talk to him. <laughs> like what changed? I mean, he just looked like the same. He looked like anybody else that was there other than he was physically perfect. <laughs> and a lot of women are like, amen. <laughs> so I'm making my way over to Cool Pastor, who, who has all this stuff. You know, that, that's why I'm just having a oh, wait, many curry favor with the ruler, and everyone is the friend of the one who gives. And, I make, and this guy stops me, and he wants to, he's like, amen. Do you have a minute? And I'm like, mmm. I'm trying to make moves. And what, what, what do you want from me? And, and he starts talking. And, and the guy starts choking. And this guy was in a pit. And I'm like, oh, could you hurry? Could you emote faster? And then he asks me that question. He's like, would you pray for me? And I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, oh. If I talk to the Lord, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> He's going to walk out of the room, you know? <laughs> and as soon as I just got my bearings right, it's like, wait a minute. Like, why do you want to go be with him? Because he's important. And yet Jesus said, when you're among the least of these, here I am wanting to be with this big man over here and Jesus Christ is right in front of me. And I felt that gut check like, so who do you want to be with? You know, and I'm like, you Lord, you know. And I don't have a story of like, I got to meet, the, I didn't get to meet him, but I got to meet him. It's like, it's, it's, it's not just them, it's me. Like, like it, me, I, we, all of us, like, we're, we're such suckers for it. It's like the Lord himself is like, I, w- I want to be your best friend. I want to be close to you. D- does it mean something to you that the king of glory says to you, open your gates and let the king of glory come in? <laughs> Number one, check, check your motives. Number two, be the kind of friend that you want. It, it's hard growing up. It, when we go on vacation, I remember we were at the beach one time and, and my eight-year-old, her sisters had left her and her brothers were doing something else and she's kind of left alone and she sees this other kid and she goes, there, she's like, hey, how old are you? That's like the opening question. How old are you? You ever seen kids do this? This is networking. How old are you? I'm eight. She says, I'm eight. Let's be friends. Don't you wish you could do that when you grow up? Wait, how old are you? I'm 38. I'm 38. Can we be friends? You're 60? I'm 60. Let's be friends. You've got two nostrils? I have two nostrils. Let's be friends. Don't you wish it was that easy? Just to, just to at least kick it off. Like, we, we grown-ups, we leave church services kind of wishing someone would come and say something to us, but, like, we've grown past that whole... Can we play? I just think it would be so refreshing to have like grown-ups say, can we go out and play? Like you see someone's wife. Can, can John come out and play? We're playing pickleball today. Can, can he come out and play? I'm, I'm going to go and eat some baby back ribs from Sonny's Barbecue. <laughs> Thanks to Shannon Snell. I'm, we're going to go get, would someone like to get some baby back ribs with me? Like there's, there's something about See, be the kind of friend that you want. The challenge is that I, I think right now that the challenge can be, I think we might want friends, but some people want to have friends, but they don't want to be a friend. He who desires friends must show themselves friendly. So I, I just want, I'm going to give you some sort of principles from Scripture that, that kind of help with this. What, what kind of friend do you want? Like, what, what are some of the how-tos on how to be friend? Number one, be transparent. Don't wear a mask. Everyone say, take the mask off. Be transparent. I was reading this from Paul Tripp. He said, we live in an interwoven, we live in interwoven networks of, listen to this, terminally 
casual relationships. We live with the delusion that we know one another, but we really don't. We call our easygoing, self-protective, and often theologically platitudinous conversations, we call them fellowship, but they seldom ever reach the threshold of true fellowship. We know cold demographic details about one another, married or single, what country you come from, type of job, number of kids, what's your address, but we know very little about the struggle of faith that is waged every day behind well-maintained personal boundaries. One of the things that shocks me most as a pastor is that there's a lot of people that I end up doing counseling, let's say, and through the years, and people that I've known for years, and I will find out things about them that I never would have known, and I could have sworn that I knew them. Friends, I remember when I was in college, friends that I thought, I'd, friends, I, I, I wanted, can I just beg us to take off our masks if you knew the pain of the people in this room right now, if you knew the pain of the people that are watching online right now, if you knew the, the struggles, if you knew the doubts, if you knew the addictions, if you knew the lusts, if you knew the resentments, if you knew the angers, if you knew the fears, if you knew the anxieties, this is why David would say to God, Lord, search me and know me. Look at my anxieties. Look at me. What I, I, I need us to, the church needs to be the place where there are the least masks possible. We have to be, friends, if you knew the skeletons in my closet, you'd be like, get off that stage. But don't get up, if I knew the skeletons in your closet, we might be like, get out of this room, right? Like the reality about all of us is that we are a bundle of need of the grace of Jesus. That's who we are. And acting like we have it more together than we do is so counterproductive because what we need is the grace of God. But the way that he's arranged us is that the great things in us don't come out. You can't baptize yourself. Someone else has to baptize you. And the greatest parts of you don't come out by yourself. They come out through other people, which is a challenge when you're a porcupine. Next, listen deeply, resist distraction. Proverbs 20 Verse five says, a purpose in a man's heart is like deep waters, but a man of understanding draws it out. It, it takes, we need people in our life that draw things out of us. I'm just gonna say it in a very practical way. When you're with your friends, put your phone. Can I get an amen? When some of y'all go to lunch today, I, does it bother anyone else when you watch people at lunch and they're like, everyone's on their phones? You're like, why are you guys, just do a pickup order and go eat in your car. <laughs> I mean, if that's what you're gonna do. I, it, it bothers me, like when I was a kid, I, I remember when we'd wanna watch television, eat, like eating dinner or something like that, and um, it, you know, hopefully parents are like, no, we're turning the TV off during dinner. We're gonna, we're gonna talk, this is like even the concept of breaking bread. There's a difference between, and, and I think we've, we've moved into that drive-through realm of, 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 of the era right now. Like we drive through, we pick up our burger, we get some fries, we start eating on the run. There's a difference between a drive-through relationship and someone that sits down and breaks bread or shares the fufu if you've ever had fufu, or someone that, that breaks some bread and they eat some food and you have a... Con when, when, we went to, when we went to Italy, I remember, I, were we in Rome? We're, and I wanted to get in and out and 40... Like, no, 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 you're eating for like two or three hours. I'm like, what? And Ruthie's like, but you're with me. And I'm like, yeah, but... A two or three hour meet, and the idea is, the idea of breaking bread is the concept that when you break bread with someone, you're lowering your quills, you're lowering your guard, and you're looking at a person and saying, I want to be a man of understanding, I want you to be a man of understanding, and the scripture says, a man of, it takes understanding to draw things out of somebody. You don't get that by listening while you're also, tech. when someone says, hey, hey you go ahead, I I'm listening. No, no, no. Even if you're listening, you are not a man of understanding. You are a companion, and a man of many companions suffers harm. I don't need more companions, and I don't need more acquaintances. What you need are friends. 
Friends are able to dial in, to, to tune in and say, I hear what you said, but I think I understand why you said it. Who are the people that don't just know what? They know why. ¿Por qué? ¿Quién entienden? ¿Por qué? Algo está pasando en tu vida. Who are the people that get? They're like, wait, no, I get it. Be transparent. Number two, listen deeply. Number three, be trustworthy, not a gossip. Proverbs 11, 13, a gossip betrays a confidence, but a, trust, a trustworthy person keeps a secret. Proverbs 11, 12, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. You'll be, in, you'll be at work and one coworker is belittling another coworker. What should I do? Remain. Say it again, remain. Don't join in that gossip. Because if Joe will gossip to you about Tom, then Joe will gossip to Tom about, be, have a little more understanding. You're like, no, he wouldn't do that. No, a gossip is a gossip is a gossip. And by the way, all of us are guilty of this, but the Bible says what fr friends are known, that when you give them your secrets, they hold them. I remember one time I was, with my friend Brian, my longest friend Brian, we've been friends since elementary school. And well, we knew each other in elementary school. We became friends in middle school. We became best friends in high school. We went to college together. Our spiritual journeys have been very parallel. I've been in valleys with him, and he's been in valleys with me. He was the best man in my wedding. I was the best man in his. There, there are very few people that, that I, I would ever trust. He's one of the greatest friends a human could possibly have. And he... And he knows me, and, and he's got nothing to gain from me. And, and I mean, sometimes I'll be out in Gainesville somewhere. I remember I was just walking to the grocery store, and someone came like, oh, Pastor Mike, we love you. Like this, they all oh, just, oh, we love you, we love you, we love you. Like, hey, could we get some money from the church? And I'm like, I don't know if you understand. Like, I don't actually have access to the, the way we set things up. The pastor does not have access to it. So if any of you were wondering, like, I can't, I couldn't get a check, for, you know, whatever. I'm like, hey, we've got other, like, oh. And it was real clear, like, I sort of fell in their, their little pecking order of coolness, importance, or whatever. They're, oh, they were kind of done with me. You know, I was like, oh. Brian has nothing to gain from me, and he just loves me anyway. It's really good to be loved by people that love you. I want you to have that in your life. And I remember I was in a situation, and someone was kind of asking a question of like, hey, uh, I, I bet you could expose Mike. I bet you've got, you could pull all the skeletons in his closet. And his response was, I could. And he could pull out the skeletons in mine. But he's been a vault for me, and I will be a vault for him. And he's a safe place. I dream of the church being more like Jesus than we are like the world right now. We live in the world now where everyone, like the Bible, Proverbs says that it's the, it's, the glory, it's, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. When you bring your sins to Jesus, he can, just so you know, when you bring your sins to Jesus, they have found a safe place. There is a vault where you are now safe and secure. Is anyone else besides me glad that the Bible says confess your sins to God? And he's faithful and just to forgive them and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, he's like a, a vault. When you find the people that can be like a, that can't be a gossip. That's why it's so dangerous because God is the opposite of a gossip. And by the way, I'm not talking about covering up injustice. Of course, it's the glory of kings to go do justice where justice has not been done. Well, absolutely, especially in light of all the crazy things we hear going on right now. I'll tell you this, though. Even among churches where you're hearing about falling leaders, write it down. Every single time you are seeing leaders who did not have friends. Next thing is to sharpen. Proverbs 27, 27. Sharpen. Don't weaken. As iron sharpens iron. Church, you need to find... And recognize, distinguish the difference between what I would call VDPs and VIPs. VDPs are very draining people. VIPs are very inspirational people. You, I'm, listen, be available to anybody and love everybody, but you got to be careful when you've got way more VDPs than VIPs, you're going to get drained and you're going to get worn out. You need some people in your life that they love you, they're for you, they're with you. They're very inspiring or very VEPs, very encouraging and very life-giving. Next 
is to encourage, not flatter. Proverbs 29.5 says, those who flatter spread nets. You don't need people to flatter you. Friends don't flatter. That's not what they do. Friends are not flatterers. They encourage. I love this quote from Mark Buber. He says, the greatest thing a person can do for another is to confirm the deepest things in him or her. The greatest thing someone can do for someone else is to take the time to have the discernment to see what is most deeply in there, most fully that person, and then confirm it. I'm telling you, I've been in microchurches where this happens. I've, I've been in the microchurches where people, I, I've, I've, someone prayed, and, and someone stopped and like, man, John, every time you pray, the faith level in the room just rises I'm like, oh, no, I don't know. And then all the other people are like, no, John, that's true. When you pray, faith comes up. Or someone says, hey, I just have a comment. They're like, man, Mary, you have like this wisdom. When you, when you speak, there's, and oh, no, no, I don't know if that's true. Friends, God made you in a way. You are dependent on other people to pull the deepest things out of you. See, see this is why our culture try to tell us, you've got everything you need in yourself. That is a lie. That is a lie. Now, you need Jesus, and you can say, well, all I need is Jesus. Well, technically, that's true. The problem is part of the Jesus that you need is in her and in him and in her and in her. That's the other, that Jesus is not just inside of you. And I have noticed that the Jesus in y'all often notices things that the Jesus in me has held off on revealing because he wants me to remember that I'm dependent because I was made in his image. In the image of God, he made us, male and female, but he made us in his image. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is only one God. There's not three. There's only one. But God's very nature is relational. That God himself, to be Father, Son, and Spirit, part of what it's telling us is that we were made in the image of friendship itself. That's part of what this means. You and me need friends to pull out the greatest parts of us. There are some of you that are one great friendship away from the greatest breakthrough of your life. You need friends, and I need friends. Next, that's, next is speak the truth in love. Don't hold back. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. The wounds of a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. I hear people say, well, I was going to confront her, but I love her too much to confront her. No, you love you too much to confront her. There is no love without confrontation at times. God loves us enough to confront us to call us on the carpet. Better is open rebuke than love concealed, the Bible says. We, we need, you need friends in your life that speak the truth in love. Now, we Christians need to be careful because Christians have been guilty of speaking the truth in very unloving ways. That's kind of like kissing someone or making out with somebody with really bad breath. You're a good kisser, but the breath really ruins the whole experience. If you ever kiss somebody that was smoking, you're like, ah, not into licking ashtrays, Right? I'm not saying I have. <laughs> Do you smoke? <laughs> Speak the truth in love. I, I, I was reading this week about, it was June 1938, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. He was writing a letter to the editor describing why he was behind schedule on his book, The Hobbit. He said that instead of drafting new material, he was actually going backwards and starting over, writing the first three chapters all over again. They asked him, what was your motivation for making such a radical decision that's such a squandering of your time? He said, my motivation was an honest but critical conversation from a friend. They said, who was your friend? He said, oh, it's this guy named C.S. Lewis. Walk with the wise, you become wise. <laughs> Walk with C.S. Lewis you're going to write books that become movies. <laughs> Walk with the godly, you become godly. Walk with the self-controlled, you start to be self-controlled. Walk with fools, you become a fool. Walk with the content, you find a way of being content. Walk with the peaceful, you find a way to chill when people cut you off in traffic. Walk with the righteous, you become righteous. Walk with those that love justice, you become just. 
Speak the truth in love. Next, tune in. Don't disconnect. Proverbs 26, 18. Like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death is the one that deceives his neighbor and says, oh, I was only joking. The reason I bring this one up is I've seen many people that have been very hurt by people that were joking with them. Someone tells a joke at your expense. And they're like, hey, man, I was joking. I didn't mean anything by that. See, if you're going to be a good friend, how do you make friends? Part of it is you tune in to the person. And many of us joke around in ways often. I've been very, very, very guilty of this, joking around. And someone's not loving the joke. They're, they're laughing and joking. You're like, my chest is on fire right now. Proverbs says, like a man that takes a, like imagine if I had a bow and arrow, put fire, and I aimed it to the crowd and shot it, that's the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. The principle is not that you're never to joke. The principle is that when you do joke, you actually are emotionally intelligent enough to be in touch with the affections and the personalities of the people that are around you, that you get it. And if you do not have high emotional intelligence, you do not need to joke at other people's expense ever. Correct? Because sometimes people are burning. You're like, oh man, wasn't that great? And they're in their minds thinking, I never want to be with you again, which is why I'm glad I've got you on here because I'm about to block you. <laughs> Last one I'm going to give you is to be intentional. Be intentional. Be the kind of friend you want. You, you got to be in, intentional. What, what are your values? What is it that you are into? What do you, what do you like? When my friend Brian and I, in the year 2000, we went to... Brazil. We, we spent some time in the favelas of Brazil, in the slums of Brazil, just with, with some missionaries that were doing things and, and indigenous people that were doing things among the poor in Brazil. And you can just leave that up there just for a second. But the, the poor Brazil were there. And, and, and we were, to be honest, we were a little, I, was, I had been a youth pastor. He had been doing some campus ministry. Both of us were getting a little dis, very disenchanted with the American church how much money gets wasted, how much time gets wasted, all the injustice, all the unrighteousness, all the hypocrisy, all the stuff. And both of us were like, man, we go to these other countries and we saw, we, there was a guy with multiple PhDs giving his life for the poor in the slums of Brazil. And we're just like, man, you know, what's, what is going on with, with the, and, and bo both of us were like, we never want to be a part of the American church. That's kind of where our hearts were. And we're, we're about halfway back from Brazil to America, to Miami, and we're like, hey, if we ever were going to be part of the church, though, what would, it, what would have to be the, the conditions? And so I took out a napkin. You know those little napkins they give you on planes where you, like, that you put your drinks on? I just took out a napkin, opened it up, and I took out a pen. And I said, if we were ever going to be a part of the church and leadership, what would it have to have? And we started saying things like, it's not just going to have people come to church. It's going to have people that follow Jesus, like disciples. We said things like you would have to have righteousness and justice. We're tired of, of, of ministry that's like, oh, people are into morality, but they're not into justice. Or people are into justice, but they're not into righteousness and, and good ethics and good moral. We're like, we want both righteousness and justice. We, and we threw it out there. We want to be a part of a church that half of everything that gets spent goes to missions. And that's really like the vision of our church kind of got birthed on a napkin with a friend flying back from the slums of Brazil. But it was intentional. Brian and I are not, we, we are brothers, but, but he's my friend. Friends have to be intentional. Who are the people, do you have the people in your life that there's a good chance that 22 years from now, if you fail or succeed, they're still gonna be there? Do you have some of those people? And if you don't, that's okay. Start it today. Get some, get, get some, of, these prog get some of these progress uh, moments happening even today. But it starts by being the kind of friend you want to be. Number one, check your motives. Number two, be the kind of friend you want to be. And number three, and this is where I end it, if you want to make friends, you're going to have to make friends with the ultimate friend. In John 15, and this is where I end it, John 15, verse 12, Jesus said, this is my command, love each other the way that I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down their life for their friends. Church, when God's, there's some of you that I feel like I need to give a warning right now. There are some of you that God has sent friends into your life that you've been neglecting. And I want you to reach back out to them and to bring them in. Don't let them go. Don't, don't by neglect, let it go. Love each other as I have loved you, Jesus says. 
You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should last so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give it to you. This is my command. Love each other. See, friends, the reality is there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and his name is Jesus. There is a friend who speaks the truth in love, and his name is Jesus. There is a friend that sharpens like iron. There is a friend that has open rebuke and revealed love. There is a friend that does everything that you and I would need. And the amazing thing to me about Jesus, and this is the mystery of Jesus, is that everybody knew that God is great, that God is transcendent, that every every religion has acknowledged some form of the distance. the, the The word, the theological term is the transcendence of God. God is great and greatly to be praised. I want to make sure you understand this. As high as the heavens are above the earth, thank you, Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so much greater is he than anything we can imagine. The mystery of Jesus is that God is not just transcendent, but that he is eminent. It is in Jesus that we learn we come to God by bowing our knees and confessing him as Lord. But when we do, the God who we bow to says, I no longer call you servants. I call you my friends. Abraham, the Bible says, is the man of faith. But that's what we call him. Do you know what God called Abraham? His friend. His friend. Church, I'm telling you this, here's the catch. It changes you. You cannot get around this. You become like your friends. It's a law. Which is why for one day, the dream is that you're going to become godly. You need to become friends with God. I, I almost hesitate to say that. If all you were was friends and you were not his servant, that's not enough. This is, that would be to minimize God. But God is the great mystery of the universe in that he is so transcendent and so high that God is so great that the angels say around his throne, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And yet, the God who is holy has come near. And he goes up on a cross where he takes our sins and our wrath and our failures on himself. And all of us know, we, the reason our porcupine quills are up is because all of us know there's something wrong with us. All of us know it. And if you get too close to me, you're going to figure it out. And if you figure out what's too wrong with me, you're going to reject me. And I don't want to be rejected. And I, and I want to be loved. But, but I can't, if I let you get too close, you're going to see me like I am. And the closer you get, then you won't love me. And I really want to be loved. So we've settled for acquaintances who junior varsity love us, but our souls are longing to be loved in the deepest parts. We want that deep stuff that only comes by getting close, up close where someone knows all your junk, but the quills are up. And there's only one thing that can lower those quills. And it's friendship with God. Because when you come close to him, I want you to like me. And I hope you love me. But even if you don't, and even when they don't, the king of the universe does. And that love and that friendship does something in a soul that changes you forever and it makes you the kind of friend that you're supposed to be